Good morning. I see some of you have already uh, encountered my latest book that I've written. So make sure that if you don't have one, get one before you leave. It, uh, the presentation we're going to do today is the do's, don'ts, why's, why nots, my opinions, other people's opinions, and uh, a few stories in between. So everything that you're going to see on the PowerPoint today is in this book. So a lot of the same pictures and so forth. So I think you'll find it interesting. At least I hope you do. Uh, a little bit about me. Yes, uh, I was fortunate enough to found the company. Started back in 89, selling wiring harnesses at swap meets. Um, an avid hot rodder. Built my first car in 1963, you see up there in the corner. I also have a front engine dragster that I like to drive. And I got my little truckster that I built in 2009, which was a feature vehicle at SEMA. And also one of the challenge vehicles on the Hot Rod Power Tour. So that was pretty interesting, driving it from uh, a cross country on Power Tour. Here's some of the topics that we're going to talk about today, just all kinds of different things, electrical. It's all basic stuff. Uh, some people say, well, why do you keep talking about the same thing over and over? Well, basics never change. So you're going to find some of those items that, were, that will be a little repetitious, but uh, hopefully uh, enlightening as well. Do's and don'ts. We'll start here. First thing you want to do if you're going to be rewiring a vehicle of some type is take your jewelry off. Anybody in here ever had jewelry on and got it, got it attacked by the battery? It, uh, it's not a fun thing. I mean, you, you go up and smoke real quick. So, you know, take, take your jewelry off and so forth, and uh, your arm and hands could be looking like these wires right here that uh, have been... Overloaded, shall we speak? Those particular wires come off an ignition switch off of a GM style type column that was used uh, to power up the electric fans, the air conditioning, everything else without any relays. So there's, it can only handle so much. So, in, in that same theme, you know, to prevent all kinds of different problems like wires burnt and so forth. Uh, we always recommend lo using lots of relays for those type of situations. Uh, and then on the right here, you'll see a little fuse block. This is out of a 57 Chevrolet. So the old uh, gum wrapper trick going on there. Days going by. Definitely don't want to do that anymore. Not with all the new electronics. Uh, when you're running wires, make sure they're tied up nice and tight because uh, vibration is the wire's worst enemy. And you can see the, from the photo here on the right, that is quite a mess going on there. Uh, that was a fresh install, by the way. I uh, don't know who did it. I really don't want to know who did it, but anyways. A lot of times we have, uh, well, how many of you have seen this before? This little ground strap hanging off the side of the, the firewall or something like that. You ever seen one of those like that? Pretty common. It seems like every time you pull the engine out to overhaul it or do some modifications, that little strap never gets hooked back up for some reason. And it's very, very important because that ground strap ties the engine to the body for proper conductivity of the current for gauges and so forth so they all <clears throat> I'll work correctly. I usually, like this one here, uh, I like to have a battery cable, something really heavy that we know that's going to be carry all the currents as necessary. So I put one of those between the frame and the engine, and then also I have uh, a ground strap like this from the body to the frame. This is uh, the front... Uh, core support, I lost it there for a second, uh, in a Corvette that we worked on. It was a custom-built Corvette, so we had to make a ground strap, so to speak, for all the grounds and so forth for all the front lights. So this is how we did it. We just did a strap, and then, and then it's all tied into that main core support, which is tied into the frame and the engine mounts. No. 
Mm -hmm. We're going to get into that. We sure. Yep. Yep. We're going to get into that really well. Uh, system safety. This is a, uh, every, years ago, everybody used uh, uh, fusible links. Not too many of those anymore because they're such a pain in the drain to change and so forth. And they went to a maxi fuse. Uh, all of our kids come with a 78 maxi fuse. Now we're going into something called a MIDI, M-I-D-I fuse. And it's a little flat strap with a fuse in the center. Very, you can get them at any auto parts store. And uh, we have one being made for us that has two of them in it. One of them is for the alternator and one of them is for the chassis harness. So it protects the overall system. Very, very important. Tools. Uh, you can buy anything from a $3.98 thing at the at the local closeout store all the way up to a hundred dollar tool if you wanted to use. So the the better the tool, the better the crimp, the, the better the conductivity, and the longer it's gonna last. One of the things that are is very important that uh, I want to show here in this picture is all terminals are made on a slide machine. And a slide machine is just takes a piece of steel copper or whatever brass and it, it stamps it, cuts it, folds it, bends it, tweaks it, the whole nine yards. And at the at each one of these terminals has a uh, a slot in it where this where the two sides are rolled together. So you always want to make sure that if you're going to use a uh, a dimple die type die that's that's being showed here, there's the male and here's the female that the female side is where that, that sl split is in the terminal. That makes for, the, uh, for a better crimp, and it'll hold the wire a whole lot better. The other kind of crimps are, uh, we call them a roll crimp. This is what's used in most machines that... Uh, the original OE makers, you know, Ford, GM, Chrysler, and so forth, they'll have these type of terminals, and they'll use either a hand terminal, like a hand crimper like this is what we use out in the field, or it's done on a machine like these terminals were done. These were all done on a machine like we have at the factory. And it, uh, it doesn't just crimp the wire this way. It folds the wire into the copper for an absolute positive uh, contact and a good grip. We have uh, lots of different kinds of wire being used in the, in the industry, and these are the four most common. If you went down to your local O'Reilly's or AutoZone or wherever, more than likely if you buy a spool of wire, it's going to be PVC or GPT. And what that is, it, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. It just has a lower melting point when it comes to heat and in the engine compartment. So most of the aftermarket manufacturers like us use an XL type wire. It's cross-link, and it is a lot higher temperature rating, and it also has really high strands on the inside. Now, the difference between GXL SXL and TXL. The only difference is the thickness of the insulation. SXL is the thickest insulation, GXL is the next, and TXL is the thinnest. And the reason the reasons people use the different ones are, you know, their own prefer, uh, preference. We use TXL and it's the thinnest for the reason of my racing background and a lot of people that, uh, that we sell in the racing industry. The harness, if it was made out of TXL compared to SXL, the, the harness itself would be about five pounds less. It's just, and you're buying the insulation, so all you're putting in. Well, when it's also that thicker wire or thicker insulation, 
instead of the bundle being this big, it becomes this big. So it's also a routing. It makes a big difference. So now you know, if you ever want to know what kind of wire we use and why, that's why. Okay, to answer your question, soldering versus crimping. Soldering is the best thing in the world for a television set. But we're not working on televisions. I am a firm believer in crimping, uh, and I'll tell you why. Most people, and there's some people, uh, that use a soldering iron every day in their business or whatever they're doing. They're really good at it and they know how to control it. Most people do not. And what happens is they'll heat, kind of, kind of get a going a mess like we got going right here. They'll heat the wire or heat the, heat the solder and then they put it down on the wire or vice versa and, and Pretty soon you know they got the wire way too hot. It's crystallized the copper. The solder is a cold joint. Then they, why it, then they don't wonder why it doesn't work. So with a crimp, and these are some machines that we have at our factory, everything is crimped just like the OE does. But that's a reason. If you're really good at it, it's great. If you're not, stay away from it. You'll have problems. My opinion. Uh, when you're crimping terminals, here's uh, three examples. Uh, two are bad, one's good. This one here, the, the, the strip was, uh, the insulation strip was way too long, so we've got bare copper showing here and bare copper showing here. This one here was still too long, so they just shoved it down in there and strung the wires out, the, the strands out this way. And then we have the correct way. It's, it's even at the bottom. The insulation is well up inside the terminal. And uh, it's good and safe that way. Once again, here's another picture of the split in a terminal that we were talking about earlier. Here's a, we're going to change gears a little bit. And we're going to talk, start talking about alternators. How many of you in here have a one-wire alternator on your hot rod? Most people do. Why? A piece of cake to put on, right? Hook up one wire and you're done. Well, our tech line gets a lot of questions, and I get them out on the road. And they'll say, I put on a brand new 100-amp alternator, and I'm only getting about 12, 5, or something like that, my voltmeter never comes up, as you can see in this one illustration on the left. And so I went out, and I bought a 140-amp alternator, put it on there, and it does the same thing. There's something wrong, something wrong. I said, well, do you have a one-wire alternator? Well, yeah. Okay, now I'm going to tell you why. It's doing that. One-wire alternator has this main battery wire, so the only thing it sees, the, the regulator on the inside, it's looking to see what the system voltage is. And the only thing it can see is what the battery voltage is. It can't see what's in the dash, in the taillights, or anything else. It doesn't know. So it only charges enough to satisfy the battery. Now, what if we have the three wire like came on OE. Then we not only have the red wire to the battery and it is showing the regulator what's going on. Now we also have what we call an exciter wire. This wire comes from the fuse block, comes in and tells the regulator how much voltage is in the fuse block. And bingo, look what happens to the gauge because then the regulator will allow the alternator to put out a higher voltage to maintain what's needed in the fuse block. Pretty simple. So 
I don't know if I call it splitting or not, but it's getting that impulse or it's getting that signal from the fuse block that here's the voltage here and the regulator is set to, let's say it's set at 14.2. Well, if the, if the signal from the fuse block is only 13.6, it's going to raise the voltage to bring that up to the 14.2. The alternator may be putting out 18 volts to maintain what the system needs, but it'll only show because the fuse block is also feeding current to the voltmeter, so it's only going to show what is actually into that section of the, of the harness. So if you have that problem, that gives you kind of a little idea how to solve it. Speaking of alternators, uh, same guy, got his 140 amp alternator, cruising the fairgrounds, and got the air conditioning on, electric fans are running wide open, just having a great time. And the next thing you know, the engine dies. Why? Everything's running fine? Well, come to find out, he's been running on battery all the time that he's been cruising rather than the alternator. Because a typical alternator uh, at idle is only putting out about 35 amps. Well, the electric fan is pulling more than that. So guess what? It's just, it's just eating itself up. The electrical system's eating itself up as far as current. So what do we do to solve this problem? Well, there's now alternators on the market that look identical. I mean, the only difference is the way the stators and so forth are, are made on the inside. This, the new ones... Uh, and I'll, I'll, you know, I use PowerMaster personally, so I'll, I'll talk about them. There's other, one, other good ones out there as well. Is the fact that now, this one it only put out 35 amps at idle. This one puts out 85 amps at idle. It's not the top number that counts. It's the bottom number that counts. That can be a 500 amp alternator, but it's still only going to put out 35 amps at idle. So it's not going to do you any good. So make sure that if you ever in need of an alternator, get one that's going to put out at the low RPM to support the electric fans, the air conditioning, the stereo, and everything else that you might want to run. Very, very important. How do you determine that by just a standard alternator and what the RPM level is at your Well, in most cases, you won't, if you went down to your Napa store or your O'Reilly store, they're going to give you an alternator, and it's not going to have a tag on it to tell you what it is. But if you go to an aftermarket, they will have a tag on there. They've already dynoed that alternator. They know exactly what it'll do at what RPM. Okay, that, that, that's yes. Okay, thank yes. You. Questions? Uh, just a little tip here. A lot of times uh, we'll have a we'll have your hot rod sitting in the uh, in the garage over the winter, no uh, trickle charger on it. Or sometimes it's in the summer. You 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 just got back from rod run. You're parking in the garage. Uh, you and your wife get in an airplane. You go to Cancun for a week or something. You come back. Go out there and try to start it. And the battery's dead. What happened here? Well, here's an easy way to find out what caused it. Just unhook one of the cables. It could be the negative cable or the positive cable. doesn't make any difference. Off the battery. And put a test light in series. In other words, the test light is now going to be the rest of that cable. And if there's a draw anywhere in the vehicle, that light will come on. Well, if that's the case... Okay, now we, have, we, we know we have a draw. The number one cause of current draw to run a battery down during the idle time of a vehicle is the alternator. Number one cause. Number two cause, stereo. So, first thing you do, 
First thing you do is unplug the alternator. Take the wires off of it. Is the light still on? If it is, okay, we know the alternator's good. Put it all back together. Then we start pulling fuses. Let's find out which circuit is causing the problem. And we pull fuses until the light goes out. Now the key to it is, is don't, if you like pulling this fuse here for the gauges, pull it out and leave it out. Don't put it back in. Because there may be two different circuits causing the problem. So we leave it out, and then we'll go to the AC, or we'll go to whichever one until the light goes out, and then we can start putting the fuses back in until the light goes back on, and we know that that particular circuit has the problem. And then we can go from there and see what it is. I had uh, a 38 Chevrolet with uh, uh, was it auto sound or one of those units that fit in the dash, and then the, the main unit was in the trunk. And it, wouldn't, it would run the battery down in about 10 days. So I always had to leave the fuse out for the constant radio section until I drove the car, then I put it in and listen to the radio because it would run the battery down every time. Worked great, just lots of voltage draw. Uh, pretty common thing here, but it's uh, interesting as well. There's a, you know, the electrical theory is that current does not go through the wire, it goes around the wire. Uh, in saying such, a lot of people, well, my house is wired, and all those are just single strands. That works fine. Well, yeah, they do. But they're, they're low amperage, they're high voltage, so it makes a big difference there. So when we talk about wires, we talk about t the, the TXL and SXL and all those type of wires a little while ago, they're all real high strand, lots of strands on the inside. That way they can carry lots of current at low voltage. And that's why you'll see battery cables like these. These are a pic This is a picture of some of the painless cables. Uh, they're they're a, a one gauge, real high strand. And usually somebody will ask me, well, can you use welding cable? Because, you know, an you know, arc welder, it has cable about this big around. There must be about a bazillion strands in there. And, yeah, they work really good because there's more strands. It's going to carry more current. Uh, battery cables... I believe the same thing about them as I do the rest of the wiring. I like to crimp the, the, the terminals on. I have a little hammer crimper, as you can see here. And the reason I do this, and some people say, well, why don't you solder them? Well, the problem is, is especially on the positive one, the positive cable is going down and hooking to the starter right next door to that glowing red hot header that's when you're going down the highway. So what happens, solder melts at a real low point in temperature so the next thing you know it's the solder is dripping out on the highway as you're going down the road and the wire comes out of the crimp terminal or out of the solder terminal and then everything is done so I like to crimp them and then heat shrink them uh, and we use special heat shrink that has glue on the inside that keeps the moisture out the dirt out and so forth helps keep the corrosion down There's that picture again of the cables, just some handmade cables and so forth. This particular, we make the, the cables that are available are either a real short ground cable like this one here, the battery's in the trunk, so it just comes through the trunk and hooks directly to the frame and, you know, with some grommets to protect it. And then now we have, when we do this, we have to attach the frame to the engine, hence the large cable here. But you can also buy the, buy the cable kits that the, the ground cable and the positive cable are both the same length. That way you can run both of them up to the engine uh, transmission assembly uh, for better conductivity and current flow. It's actually the better way to go. Pretty expensive because a lot of copper there, but it's really the best way to go.
the frame works as long as you use some star washers and so forth to uh, make sure that we got a good good contact uh, here's another short cable this was in a 52 Merc we transplanted a 5 liter in and uh, it just the battery's right here so we just run the cable down and just put it on the factory stud right there where the factory cable went Mm hmm yeah yeah it just uh yeah normally there's a star washer right there between the cable and the and the base of the stud uh starters it's kind of an interesting interesting subject the over the years this is the typical gm starter that you've seen forever uh and the differences between this one, the Chrysler, and the Ford, mm, they're all basically, well, the, the, the Chrysler, early Chryslers were different. But uh, these, as a, as a straight armature type starter, require a lot of current to spin the engine. So how do we, how do we get away with such smaller batteries today than we used to have? You know, used to, I mean, Series 24, all you could do to lift the thing, get it up in the tray. Where now, you know, some of the little hot rods got their little gel batteries, are not much bigger than a motorcycle battery. Well, the 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 problem is, is with, with like I say, this straight armature, it takes a lot of current to make that armature turn. But with the new ones that that have gear drive on the inside, like this Mopar, there's the motor. It's tiny and it just runs this gear motor, gear drive right here so it takes about half to one third of the current required by the old school stuff so and it's smaller clears the headers better all those type of things so if you get a chance to change it over it'll spin the engine over a lot faster too You've got a lot of high compression engines and so forth Anybody still run ammeters? Anybody? No? I would certainly hope not. The, uh, just for grands, the voltmeter, it's doing like we, we, what we were talking about a little while ago. It's measuring the amount of voltage that's in the system at the fuse block area. Where the ammeter, all the voltage, all the amperage of the entire vehicle has to go through it. This is just taking a sample. This is reading the entire amount so if we're pumping 30 amps well with the new systems you know they're all going to be 80 to 200 amps the the the, the ammeter would have to be about the size of a milk jug to you know carry all the amperage and show the show what's going on very dangerous very dangerous uh give you an idea i was coming back from back to the 50s and this has been 15 years ago, I guess, I was with my friend. We were in his 38 Chevrolet. And we were cruising down through Oklahoma, headed back to Texas, and all of a sudden, smoke starts coming out of the dash. Just, what in the world's going on? And oil was spraying everywhere on, on the inside on the carpet. We got her pulled over, shut off. And what had happened was, the oil pressure gauge had one of those nylon, little nylon tubes that you see, the mechanical gauge. It got up against his ammeter that was glowing red in the back. Guess what happened? Melted the line in two. Oil's going everywhere. Of course, that's, it's a wonder it didn't catch fire because of all the oil on that glowing ammeter back there. But uh, we got it patched up and we got home. But guess what we did the next day? Took that out, put that in. Uh, here's a little trick that I found. I've got a good friend. His name is Randy Rundle, Runzel, Runnel. Excuse me. And uh, he makes what's called a runs. So if you're changing, let's say you have a 54 Chevrolet. Just pick something. Six volts. You want to change it over, but you want to keep the original dash. How do I do that? 
How do I make the fuel gauge, pick one, work on six volts when everything else is, is 12? This little item here, one end here, attaches to the gauge with on the stud. This end here, we put 12 volts to. This wire here then goes to ground. It's what we call a Zener diode. A Zener diode is a voltage regulator. And it, it, they, they come in all different sizes, presets, and so forth. But this one is a 6 volt. So we have 12 volts coming in, 6 volts going out to the gauge. What happens to the other 6 volts? It goes to ground. It just dumps it. So that's how we can do it. Does it make any difference? Mm -mm. No. In fact, my little uh, the little truckster you seen earlier, I've still got the six bolt starter on the flathead. I'm just running twelve bolts through it. Well, it's negative ground now, but yes, correct. Mm -hmm. The uh, pros and cons, batteries, uh, flooded versus gel or mat. The, the flooded type battery that, that's been around since day one basically uh, work really well. They're easily recharged and so forth. Not real good if you need to locate it in a tight spot or uh, some place where it may tip over because we all know what, what happens there when the acid comes out. The gel type battery, the problem with them is they're hard to keep charged. They're harder to charge than the, than the flooded battery. The, the positives, and you can put that thing anywhere you want, upside down, inside out, or whatever. And they work really well in that aspect. So a lot depends on what your use is going to be to, to make the decision on what type of battery to get. If it's just going to be a street car, something like that, uh, if you're going to put it in the trunk, oh, you may want to go this way. If it's going to be up underneath the hood, you may want to go this way. If it's going to be inside of a compartment in the trunk or something like that, then you don't want the gases and, and so forth to escape. This is the better battery. The only problem is, is, like I say, they're really hard to get charged all the way up. It takes a, it takes a long time. They're both good. Some just have, one just has better traits than the other in, in different aspects. Okay, each one of you have one of my books, I assume. If you don't, please get one. That's the reason I brought them, so you'd have one. Uh, now it's question and answer time. <laughs>